Welcome back! I'm spending a few days at home here in between the legs of my vacation travels and I thought I film a little something for you to uh, yeah, bridge over the time until I'm really back in business. And we tear down these two dead dodos from the last scrap heap scavenge card here, link in the description. So we have a USB Ethernet stick here and a wireless mouse. If I remember right, taking down that <laughs> USB Ethernet stick was quite easy. Uh, it fell apart all by its own. And I will zoom down now on the board and we see what kinds of chips we have here. So on the front side, we have here an LF8505 from Delta. Uh, this will be an Ethernet transformer. Yes, transformer, you heard it right. Uh, 25 megahertz crystal, yeah, for 100 uh, megabit Ethernet. Uh, oh, can you see that? Uh, there, marked D1, one lonely LED. <laughs> and we have this chip, uh, 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 uh. yeah, 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 8877, whatever that means. Oh, we'll have a look at that in a second. No surprises here at the back side. You see here that's an MTEL. 93C66, that's a four kilobit serial EEPROM. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Ethernet thingy on the other thing, uh, side needs probably some firmware. And then we have a run of the mill TD33C, that's just a low dropout voltage linear 3.3 volt regulator and yeah, some passives. That's it. I actually found some information about that ADA77, which is an A6, uh, AX8877 2B, obviously. And you see it's a lit chip with an USB 2.0 host interface and it can drive a 100 megabit Ethernet, either, yeah, magnetic via RJ45 or optical, uh, yeah, if 100 megabit uh, optical Ethernet is a thing for you. And of course it needs that EEPROM we saw, yeah, that was the Aptel 93C66. Personally, I find these Ethernet transformers and yeah, for fast Ethernet, they have a 100 megahertz bandwidth much more interesting. So your USB to Ethernet bridge would be on that side, our AX8877-2B and it would drive this TX transformer here with a center tap. The center tap is basically connected to 3.3 volts. Yeah, that was our 3.3 volt regulator. And the pins on our Ethernet driver here, they just pull down either pin one here to ground or pin three here to ground. So you get a change in magnetic field here and then you get a signal here in the output transformer and that goes through, yeah, that's a little bit redundant or unnecessary, a common mode choke to uh, filter out any common mode noise and then it goes out into your twisted pair. And on the receiving side, your twisted pair comes in and goes through a common mode choke with makes sense in this case because yeah the, it could have picked up some common mode noise here outside then it goes into the transformer and yeah it's isolated of course everything that happens here on the cable from what's happening here on our board it goes into our transformer and it comes out here we completely ignore that center tap here and there are some two, two times 50 ohm resistors, yeah, binding the whole thing to ground via a capacitor, yeah, just some filtering, keeping the whole thing AC centered. And that goes into our Ethernet transmitter or transceiver, whatever. Um, 
Anything else? Yeah, you have also these 250 ohm trans, uh, resistors here on the center tab to keep that uh, centered, so to speak. And the center tabs here on the other side where it goes to the cable, they are all just bound with uh, 75 ohm resistors together and with more 75 ohm uh, resistors to the other unused twisted pairs. But uh, yeah, don't cite me on that. Usually if you have some shielding, also everything is connected via a high voltage, low capacity, so voltage one nanofarad capacitor to the shield. Yeah, and that's it. It's really a lot of transformers. And the reason this looks so symmetric, so the first, the TX transformer and the RX transformer, is that they are really the same inside. If you have gigabit Ethernet, a gigabit Ethernet transformer would have four such transformer modules inside because it's using all four twisted pairs in your cable. Done! Next, the wireless mouse from B&N, <laughs> whoever that is, maybe, yeah, I don't know. And here we need actually to remove, uh, well, batteries, of course. So two AAA batteries, they might be even good. So we put them aside, uh, remove some screws to get that apart or no, I don't think so. This is all just clipped in. Hmm. Maybe there are some screws, maybe down here. Yeah, of course, there are screws. <clears throat> almost, almost. Yeah, I need a better screwdriver. That should do the job, hopefully. One. And two. And we're in. And the first thing you noticed, <laughs> they screwed here in a metal plate to give it uh, some heft or stiffness because, uh, which way around? That way around because here these were, no. Hmm. I have absolutely no idea why they put in here a metal plate. There is a reason for it, I'm sure. Maybe really just to give it some weight, but then you have the batteries here. Maybe I should remove that just to be on the short side. I mean, it's obviously not for shielding purposes, is it? Uh, pff, no. Hmm. Maybe really just to give it some more heft. I have no idea. And then we have here, yeah, the uh, scroll wheel, which is often optical type. We will see that two tactile switches here for, yeah, the two mouse switches and a third tactile switch. Can you see that? Uh, that thingy here, pressing on that tactile switch the battery case so let's get that out one and that's it yeah here's the wheel nothing interesting about that and here is the optical incremental encoder but we will see that in a second close up oh, there's another tactical switch yeah that was um, from the back side that hole here where you could reconnect the mouse via uh, whatever protocol it's using 
there's also a little switch here that I uh, on off maybe. I have no idea how you would actuate that. Yeah, maybe through that slot, but um, pff, it's not very handy, is it? I mean, you can do it with a screwdriver. And it actually says here, on, off. Ah, I zoomed out. Yeah, I know, overexposure, on, off, and uh, yeah, there was that little slider here, so you don't actually need a screwdriver to actuate that little switch there. You can do that just with your fingers, so that's okay. So, let's go over the board. So, uh, yeah, from this side we have um, below here the on-off switch. I'll have a look at the back side in a minute then. We have here the LED for illum illumination and here a signal LED. And then this is the optical sensor. Uh, P-A-N? 3205 and yeah nothing else here to see that's a inductor a capacitor there so there must be some switching going on uh, we have a closer look at that board uh, who does it all and then at the back we have our optical decoder and yeah i forgot that tactile switch here that is obviously the switch for when you press the mouse wheel. Okay, let's go to the back side. Here our on off switch and here we see the LED shine through. Well, not shine, it has no power. The uh, yeah aperture of our optical sensor and uh, just for interest, yeah, that's the optic for it. So the LED shines in here that is somehow yeah diffused downward and that's the lens for the optical sensor. Uh, yeah, that other tactile switch and that's it. Nothing else going on on the back side. Trying to give you a good view onto that little daughter board here that's vertically soldered on is a little bit of pain in the <clears throat> behind. So we have our Bluetooth or whatever antenna here. We have a little quartz. We have a little uh, three pin, probably MOSFET to drive that big LED. And we have the uh, master chip itself. And it's probably hard for you to read. I would have to bring that into another position. Uh, yeah, 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 that's better. That was better. So yeah, it's an AROA AB1120J and uh, yeah, that's a type and below that, that's just the production badge or whatever you 1913-41. Okay, uh, let me try to give you a few on the other side of that board. There's really not much going on here that uh, if you, yeah, you should be able to read that almost. That's a T24C64A uh, EE prop, of course. Uh, the thing on the other side that does it all needs, of course, an EE prom, uh, 64 kilobits and a uh, two wire interface, so I squared C. Just one page from the Aroa, Aroa Technology Core AB1120G datasheet with the uh, yeah block diagram. So that is a, a Bluetooth, <laughs> a Bluetooth uh, system on a chip uh, for human interface, and it has of course a Bluetooth radio transceiver and a baseband processing unit. I guess that means it uses software-defined radio. 
Uh, we have a power management unit, so it can go to sleep and whatnot. And we have a boost, a switch mode regulator and a low drop out linear regulator on board. A lithium iron battery charger, of course, an MCU, some RAM and some ROM and then a lot of I.O. So a uh, general purpose I.O., XYZ control, whatever that is, the LED driver, uh, but the LED driver on the chip is obviously not enough to drive that big LED. That's why we have that little MOSFET also on the board. Uh, I squared C, we will need that in a second, SPI and UART. So I haven't actually found a data sheet for the PAN3205 just for the PAN3204 but I guess they are almost the same. So this thing has also an LED driver on board. Mm, yeah, I don't know how they done it, which is driving what. Uh, we have a motion wake up signal that probably goes to the processor to a general I.O. pin. Uh, we have a power on reset. Okay. Uh, the most important thing, we have that CMOS image sensor, which we are looking at our yeah, tabletop and see when something is moving. And we have, of course, a serial interface, which is a uh, two wire, so I squared C. So the processor needs its I squared C interface to talk to yeah, our optical sensor as well as to our EEPROM. And then we have a voltage regulator, a power control, and of course an oscillator. There was somewhere a quartz on that board, wasn't it? No, there wasn't a quartz on that board. I'm just looking here. No, I would have recognized a quartz. There was no quartz on the board, but yeah, it has an oscillator. Great. And that's already it for today. Uh, I have to pack my backpack again. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so what have we learned today? Uh, well, that I find <laughs> Ethernet transformers very interesting, of course. Uh, but uh, the real lesson here is for every commodity application nowadays, so wireless mouse, USB Ethernet stick or Ethernet interfaces at all, there is a single chip or system on a chip solution available today. So you take the chip that does it all, you throw in a little EEPROM for the firmware, maybe some passives, maybe a quartz, maybe an external uh, MOSFET if you have to switch something uh, powerful like that LED here, and you're done. And with that, I say, Bye.